Welcome everyone. My name is Kate Gradson and I am the acting director and curator of the David Winton Bell Gallery of Brown University. Thank you to Greg Picard and Sean Tavares for overseeing Tech Today and to Katie Vincelette for overseeing the many other elements of this program that remain hidden. Before introducing Clifford Owens and Savannah Knoop, I would like to note that Brown, like many universities and arts institutions, is in the process of creating a meaningful acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples and their connections to the land that Brown University occupies. I adopt this language for my colleagues in the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative here at the university and invite viewers to visit the page on their website that elaborates the current process. Tonight we are celebrating Soothing the Seams, Savannah Knoop's solo exhibition at the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University. While the gallery is currently only open to students, staff, and faculty in Brown's campus testing program, we will fully open to the public July 9th, we just found out today. Please follow our social media accounts and website for updates on how to visit in person. We also now have fabulous installation images, which you will see tonight and in our social media over the coming month. Throughout this grueling pandemic exhibition process, and I believe grueling is the appropriate term from what we have all moved through this past year, Savannah radiated positivity and optimism. And for that, I am so grateful that of all the artists to collaborate with, this was our moment. In my exhibition text, I describe Savannah's practice as one that consistently centers itself within questions of intimacy, whether through performance or the recent sculptural work on view in the Bell exhibition, they deploy improvisation and proximity as strategies in the making and activation of their work. When Savannah suggested their longtime mentor and friend, artist Clifford Owens for a conversation, whose work mediates among similar frequencies, I knew that their relationship would allow for a deeper understanding of the work than what maybe I could provide as, um, as the curator of the exhibition, despite our many conversations and studio visits over the years. I think that trust and friendship have produced what I believe is the strongest online programming this past year, and I'm certain that tonight will meet those expectations. Savannah Knoop is an artist and educator working in film, sculpture, writing, and performance. They have exhibited and performed at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Philadelphia, Artist Curated Projects, Los Angeles, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, Museum of Modern Art, Movement Research, and Leslie Lohman Museum, all New York. Once again, their solo exhibition, Savannah Knoop, Soothing the Seams, is currently on view at the Bell Gallery at Brown University and will open to the public for two weeks in July. Clifford Owens is an interdisciplinary artist who makes photographs, performance art, drawings, videos, and texts. His art has appeared in many solo and group exhibitions, both nationally and internationally. Owens' solo museum exhibitions include Anthology at MoMA PS1, Better the Rebel You Know at the former Corner, Corner House in Manchester, England, and Perspectives 173 Clifford Owens at the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston. His group exhibitions include Freestyle, Greater New York 2005, and Performance Now, The First Decade of the New Century. His performance-based projects have been widely presented in museums and galleries, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music. Owens has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a William H. Johnson Prize, and numerous other fellowships and awards. He is guest faculty at Sarah Lawrence College, and he lives and works between New York City and Jersey City. Uh, thank you both for being here tonight, and I'll let you take over from here. I wish I could be there with you, but we'll all be together soon. We wish that too, Kate. Um, that was a really wonderful and generous intro, thanks. Um, yes, thank you so much, Kate. And I guess these are working, right? The microphones are working. You guys can hear us, right? I'm, I'm really I enjoy the fact that we are doing a, uh, a you know, a, a Zoom talk in person, right, fully vaxxed. So it's not um, us in other places in this mediated space. And screens are really, in fact, quite important to your work. Before we get That's there, true. so talk a little bit about the title of the exhibition, Soothing the Seams and um, maybe kind of walk us through the show a little bit. What are its component parts? And maybe along the way, talk about processes, uh, material choices, material uses, and their value in the exhibition. Oh, such a, uh, this is like such a moment. 
<laughs> here we are looking across the screen. So wonderful. Um, I'm going to put my, let me share my screen. Okay. So soothing the seams came from Kate and I discussing this piece, <laughs> which is um, a sampling of the front pages of the New York Times from 2020. I started archiving the news in November of 2019 and got a subscription to the a newspaper. <laughs> Including the Sunday subscription? Or just I started out with the Sunday subscription okay. and then I got overwhelmed. <laughs> so I kept it to the weekdays. <laughs> and um, so I have the year, I have, you know, something like 14 months of news. And um, this piece is a sampling of five to 10 of the front pages of the top of the Times, which is, you know, it was no small task to choose which one to put in, double-sided, and it's made with fiberglass and aqua resin, and so um, they're sewn together, the seams. And um, in sewing this material, which ended up being 40 feet long, wow. it didn't fit in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to kind of keep zigzagging it. Like I would roll part of it up mm -hmm. and let some of it out. And of course, because that material is so sort of stubborn, sure. like it would just want to keep, it didn't want to open up ever. Sure. And so of course, all of the seams got sort of mauled or tortured. Mm -hmm. And then it was a question of sort of going through all of the, you know, kind of incrementally going through and soothing each part of that with an oil-based product such as packing tape, uh, fiberglass tape, um, uh, two-sided, I mean, any, any kind of tape you could think of, hot tape. And, um, but it, it did feel sort of like a metaphor for like an emotional, uh, physical manifestation of the year's current mm -hmm. events coming through a very sort of low grade materials easily obtainable yes um, um, and uh, uh, not very expensive um, in terms of the, the cost of things the glue the That's newspaper it. etc yeah and so and we from this piece where do we go in the exhibition so I guess let's imagine that we're in the room yes we walk in this is the first thing you see yes you go to the right and there's um, a series of rocking tails. So Cliff has seen me make these over the years. These are um, also made out of sort of the bare units. They're made out of uh, two by fours that are glued together. And so there's a lot of seams in these as well. And um, they operate sort of as obviously they're sculptures, but they're also sort of, they have an invitation for your body to sit in them. There's hybrid furniture, fashion, uh, physical therapy. When you sit on them, the weight is is real. Um, here we have, you're not allowed to sit on them in these kind of spaces, but I see. just so you can see. I see. And you can see sort of the weight and the wobble of the weight. And um, they really do uh, tease and invite interaction, right? I think so. Um, and it's really amazing to see people interact with them. Mm -hmm. It's not great to see like small kids or, or pets. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's great to see people with them and you do sort of engage with them and they all move really differently. Mm -hmm. And the one in the center is the 2020 tail, long tail, and sort of a cyborg. It, it you, you can't rock on it. You can only roll. You can roll it. Um, so there's those. And then you turn around the corner, and there's the free weavings of the news. So this is um, 
obviously I'm going backwards. Yes. At, at this is the most recent yes. work, right? This is the most recent work. Well, and so how many of these works are presented in the exhibition? So I'm up into May news, okay. full year of news, but um, uh, or full duration of time. Right. And I guess there's one, two, three, four, five of them. So it's sort of like a month. It ends up being a month, month and a quarter, month and a half. Depending I see. On. But you've made more than the number of sculptures represented in the exhibition. I have made more, but not many more. I've made a lot of tiny ones. And this is still ongoing? This is ongoing. I have sort of like another half of the year left. And so you're, does the news... Uh, sort of inform how you deal with this material, the shapes, the forms the sculptures take. And since you started, maybe you can talk about how the form and the shape has changed from yeah. a kind of Trump moment right. to a Biden moment, which we don't quite understand yet. But maybe you talk about that more. I love that. Yeah, it does. Um, I think there's something about, you know, because you're looking at the narrative in hindsight, you you know what's going to happen and so you're sort of i think i'm these to me are abstract but they do deal in figurative moments sort of like the way when you're looking at a cloud or a piece of toast you see jesus in the piece of toast or whatever yes. depending on where you're <laughs> at and so i feel like they have they pull out moments from the year yes so you'll see the the one the the flat one is the first one. You've yes. seen that one in person. It, it has shifted a bit just because I changed the color of it over mm -hmm. the year, but it's much, it's a totally different sort of exploration of the, it's flat compared to the other. I mean, it's so kind of fascinating, the, the, uh, the notion of bringing um, uh, text into relief, bringing text into the round. Right. Um, Making it as space. Yes. Yes. And, um, and what are what do are these titled these uh, pieces or yes they're titled and they're sort of that's where it goes and plays inside of the figurative moment I think um, the the one here is chair corner not not really playing inside of that but um, I think playing inside of the the actual material in a new way um let's see let me get back to the i think i skipped through so that one is curved yes and that's through may so i feel like that's like one of the moments where it's sort of it's looking at what was happening yes. in that moment many years ago um when i was a kid yeah somebody wrote about my my work and they they described me as a language uh, I'm sorry, a, an audience and language uh, sensitive artist can talk about that sensitivity you have to language. You mm, write, here you're yeah. dealing with language. Um, <clears throat> your performances are largely nonverbal, but right. can you talk about your use of text and the importance of text and language to you, right? Yeah. Writer, com or visual artist, writer, there's many sort of ways in which text writer, comes together. Fake writer. Fake writer. <laughs> Fake news. Fake news. <laughs> um, yeah, you could call these objects with an X T S. Um, they, you know, I do. I, I respect language. I value language. I believe it's a tool. I don't believe that it should be abused. <laughs> and I think that this is an exploration of. I mean, I think that taking the current events, like taking this sort of the raw unmediated moment that can be news it can be events in our lives that these things that happen only once they only happen in time once there's a flow that thing happens and then as far as we know we mediate those moments we mediate them through our memory we tell ourselves stories about those moments the news mediates it they decides what to pull in what to leave out there's real estate involved. What do you, what all the news fit to 
print is like really real. And here you've really uh, twisted words. <laughs> That's right. And so right? I think it is actually about storytelling. Like I think of these as physical manifestations. I think stories. I was thinking about like the process of how you make the pieces, yeah, right? They twisting, do. Twisting, yeah. you're rolling. Yeah. You're, uh, okay, what about that? Yeah, you're twisting, twisting your words. Roll, twisting words. I love that. Don't twist my words. <laughs> And it happens all the time. Yes. People twist each other's words all the time. But yes. um, I also, I think it is about like all of those ways that language is used as a tool towards storytelling and narrative and like living um, is, it's actually manifested I think, through the way it commingles and the way it tangles up with other stories. These are blocks of time that yeah. then become totally mixed together. But I keep them, as I'm rolling it, I keep them very separate. So I have like the one day's news is very, I'm just going to keep them through all of this. So, so here's a detail shot of um, that process we were talking about. But here's at certain moments, words seen but they are not being used towards their original use sure. and I guess I as we talk we can watch it well maybe talk twisting the words so this is the process of um, rolling I'll take bundles and of I take so I kind of peel off the front page and then I have the day's news and I'll roll it through it's about two hours depending on the Amazing. day yeah. of news because of course they have different like sports ads a lot of data mm -hmm. and um and as you're doing it you can listen to other things you can sort of um process information and you really sort of can choose the processing of information you can't stop that's the only mm -hmm. rule i have mm -hmm. to get through it these bundles of information but um you know this is like i didn't invent this idea, people make baskets with newspaper yes. all over the world. Yes. And um, it's, it's fascinating to me just because it's sort of like taking this thing that we've now, it's a relatively modern thing, a yes. newspaper, but like recreating it into a bundle of willow sticks to weave your basket or right, whatever. Right. And we talked about Marin Hassinger's yeah. uh, use of newspaper, the twisting and yes. doing it with uh, groups of women as a kind right. of performance and an action, um, which is um, not obviously what you're doing here, but the kind of art, uh, contemporary art reference that yeah. we had talked about. And, she and many has, other artists, obviously, have dealt with the news. You it's know, a club. Adrian Piper's yeah. uh, pieces, those drawings she made. Right. Um, charcoal drawings on the New York Times. I love the newspapers. Those are really wonderful. The yeah. Vanilla Nightmare pieces. So, you're, what kind of politics in this work are you kind of infusing through the through these weaves? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea. I think, I think that it is about politics in the way that, and I think it's dealing with. Let's see if I can untangle this a bit. But it's like it's dealing within the terms of what is represented, what is hidden. And um, obviously, I guess the New York Times is a lefty newspaper, but it would have been great to have, I think, like, I started out just getting whatever news I could get my hands well, on. Well, that idea of, like, what's left behind, what yeah. is missing. Right. We had talked about labor, and one can think certainly about the disavowal of labor, like the unseen right. labor. And you talked about your work, this pro this. A particular body of work in terms of the process as being about a kind of labor. Yeah. Right? And um, practice. And a practice. Yeah. So what about that? That idea, of, you know, that, that lay, the economy of a kind of artist labor, right? Mm. I don't know if that is interesting to you. Artist labor, craft labor, yeah. or like, you know, the labor of, I don't know, the, it, it can be like cooking or walking to and from your destination, the things that are in between that kind of labor. And I think I was sort of thinking with Howardina Pindell and um, Harmony Hammond, people like that were dealing with abstraction in this highly political moment. That I think it was an unpopular thing to not be, you know, make it a banner or make it completely figurative. Yes. And 
and those artists insisted that abstraction can be political and it's moving through us, it's moving through our positions, the decisions that we make, the poetic, the artistic logic that we choose to make this work in does thread back into who we are as people. So not political, it's like as far as, you know, where you say identity politics, but just our politic of being in the that's world. Right. That's right. Because you talked about this process of making this work, you're absorbing images, you're absorbing yes. the news, you're absorbing bad news. Filtering. Right? Filtering. Yeah. Filtering. Filtering, yeah. that's a good, I think, place to kind of shift to talk about okay, some cool. other places. I love that. Right? Because screens um, yes. is... A, that's a filter. That's a filter. That's a big filter. <laughs> so our bodies as filters. Yes. Our skin as a filter. Our minds as a filter as far as what we decide to, or if we can choose, not we can't always choose, but when we decide to like engage with someone or not. Uh, the bathhouse film is, a, I think, deals with that, like this yes. sort of... Do you have installation shots of that or I video that you would like? Well, I guess we watched a little bit of the tape, but maybe you can move us through the cool. meaning of the video and give yes. us a better, more context for it. Yeah, so um, see some stills these are here. stills from it. They're aluminum, they glow, they're sort of like a found footage. Let's see, I get to move this away, but I think that the video is behind our little chat box. I see, okay. So let me move it. Okay, so, oh, there we go. so behind this wave of news, which is sort of, Kate and I decided there was a show right before, and we kept a lot of the architecture from the space, oh, from the last show, just in terms of like thinking about that idea of retooling or using things towards different means. Yes. And so the, the <laughs> newspaper, that wave of news comes in, it's almost like, a lot of this work precipitated through the bathhouse film, which is playing behind this giant wave of news. Yeah. And um, the news becomes kind of a main character in the piece. It keeps coming and swallowing bathers whole. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's the large news is sort of a manifestation of that. Let's see here. How do I move through? More screenshots of this. So I've been working on this piece. You know, you came yes. during the early salons. I went. I came twice. You came twice. Came and somebody, twice. somebody came up to you and they, they said, like, you remind me of a young Miles Davis. That's right. <laughs> we, we were on the patio. Yes. And there, there, were, there were men there demonstrating proper breathing techniques. Right. And we were smoking. Yeah. As we often do. Breathing, <laughs> smoking, breathing, smoking. So I went. That's right. And um, I was I went in the sort of beginning part, and then yeah. when you did the sort of finale, the final sort of performances. Um, yeah, and I feel like you came to one of the first events where it was like the performance salon. I'd sort of initiated this idea of framing the space. It was there was a lot going on inside of this space as far as like different kinds of everyday performance, yes. different kinds of choreography. Yes. And um, and so trying to find a way to frame that yeah. in my mind, but then also finding a way maybe to frame it for everyone involved, okay. inviting outsiders in. Yes. And, you know, it's so beautiful there in the way that, like, if you're doing something, you know, you saw me doing, like, I'd be flapping my hands, like, yes. I'm trying to escape or... <laughs> doing air marshal signals right. and fake conducting and people be like um are you still stretching over here <laughs> <laughs> so like that the wide range of movement in there is kind of fascinating yes and um but so that's how it started and then it slowly developed into the film which i think people often want to call it a documentary and i understand why but it's so much not it's, I mean, it has moments that are just, it's really about, I think, recording and documenting yes. the unmediated moment. That's right. But it's not, um, it's not trying to be objective. I, mean, yeah, I don't, I don't difference. think that it's, it doesn't feel at all like a documentary to me. I think that's yeah. just because um, most people don't know how to talk about performance art. So maybe so. But it, it's clearly very edited. It's very, You're very intentional about mm. the edits and what's happening. There's a structure to it. 
Yeah. It's not documenting. Because, in fact, if it were a documentation, the project took a long time to develop. It, it did. What was the time period? For it that? started in 2016. I think I sort of got going on those salons in 2017 yes. and did them for like eight or nine months, yeah. maybe, yeah. on and off. And I would do them just like do them in the space with whoever was there, too. Yeah. So, um, but then that led into shooting the film in February. We started doing like the big group shots with all of the rec the regulars would come and bathe like late at night because yeah. it was a party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, and that was I think actually part of what takes so long to sort of organize stuff around there is that um, nobody has pockets and nobody has phones, and so oh, it's like really like you have to sort of. <laughs> word of mouth it and you'd be like let me know i'm in locker 292 yeah. i don't remember that number i'll see you the next time so maybe you could like briefly give uh people watching a okay. sense of the you know the social um dynamics of that space yeah, people it. who may not know um exactly what you're talking about in terms of politeness about Ooh. stretching the space that you need and the community of people you met during yeah. the course of making the work and it is about economies of labor. Absolutely. You'll talk a little bit about that, maybe. And um, at the end, maybe we can talk uh, in this project in particular about what I'm always so fascinated about is embodiment. Mm. And um, that is so important, it seems, so critical, so crucial to your practice. Your mm. practice has always been about embodiment. Mm. So there was a lot of things in that there. But maybe we could start with giving people, giving folks a sense of what community looks like in this bathhouse in New York City. And yeah. I think I told you before, and this is another sort of, you know, <clears throat> digression, but uh, Rashid Johnson did. Uh, he staged uh, Amiri Baraka's Dutchman at that same place. And I was there and uh, I was. I, were you in it? I or, was. Yeah. I was like uh, myself and Terry Atkins were cast as the, um, the conductor mm -hmm. who at the very end of the play comes and says, Something like, hey, man. But Rashid had very particular reasons, obviously, for staging it there in terms of the different temperatures of the, the rooms and the heat of the play. There was a real kind of conceptual arc. You, too, have a strong conceptual reason for being in that space. So what about that as the stage, the yeah. location for the, for the performance, which is a business and, right. you know, it's not a performance space. It's in the a conventional gray sense. market economy. <laughs> But um, yeah, so so it's in. Where to start? It's on East Tenth Street. Started the heart. Yes, <laughs> which starts to palpate really fast when you're in a 240 degree room with yes. people talking about Trump. <laughs> but um, so it's in the heart of the East Village, and I think I would say it's like a truly diverse space in that yes. it has all all ages it's new york city and uh, but it's a third space it's not a bar i mean in the way that a bar is it's not a um it's not a classroom it's not yeah. an organized space people linger they do their own thing they hang out yeah. and so in new york city as as a new york business it has two businesses run under one roof yeah. david and boris David tends to go for the Groupon route, <laughs> and Boris's week, they alternate weeks, Boris's week goes for the hot cash deals. You get a Polaroid of yourself or an analog a cardboard card, and if you lose it, your membership is gone. And you can get different deals depending on, I think, how busy they are yeah. and what mood the people who are working the front stage are in and um but it engenders like a very specific group of regulars go there so it's this project is specifically about boris week I see. yeah I see. and um there's regulars who've been going like over 30 years 40 years i mean it's been open since the 1890s and i think the, of course, none of the people in your project were born then. No, so, but, and also I think it's gone through maybe three different ownerships. 
Um, but it's like pe some people have been going since the 80s. Mm. And there's all the mythology, like John Belushi used to go or mm. whatever. People would go or, you know, like somebody sued them because they said that they're, they could boil an egg in their bathroom. Oh, like, well. <laughs> the heat was radiating. But maybe out. go back to this idea of the front stage and the backstage oh, cool. and, you know, Irving Golf mm. and, and performance in everyday life and those ideas that um, we've talked about. I think when I saw my seminar when I was at a school in the American South <laughs> where I met you. Yes. I think I introduced that text. That yes. idea of like, <clears throat> certainly I play um, at the bathhouse, right? So folk who in their ordinary everyday lives could be high powered professionals or, right. you know, pimps and prostitutes. We don't really know, but there's a whole kind of social class. Right. Uh, Gen, uh, gender, e economic, uh, yes. political range, but in that space, um, perhaps social decorum in the everyday world is sort of um, shed. You disrobe it. <laughs> shed. Yeah. Your everyday. Uh, yes. Decorum of uh, performances. Right. right. That's right. And so, what happens when that happens? That's right. What happens when that happens? I mean, one of the only things you can carry with you is your opinions. Yeah. And there are a lot of loud ones in there. Um, and there, I think there's, the community is bound by the, the sheer fact of craving this environment, this heat, the different temperatures of the space. And people go every day. And um, let's see. So I feel like I got so excited and then my mind went blank. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my initiation to the space came through sort of getting the money together for the unlimited yearly pass and, and then being sort of like insulted by Boris and being like, shit, he's an asshole. He's, and, and it can be very unfriendly in there too. Um, but you're not, maybe if you're there to bathe, you make concessions about that, those decorums. And in my mind, when that sort of first initiation happened, I teetered between like, should I go back and try to get my money back, which felt like an impossibility in that space. But I, I shifted it into like, oh, I'm officially a member here because I've that's been what, insulted yeah. the way everyone else has. And that's what I mean about your practice of embodiment. You went to the bathhouses because you also benefited from the heat and the pool and the relaxation and the breathing. Yes. And I think in the process of making the work, the folk who were part and parcel of it actually did a great deal to help you in your everyday life too, right? Absolutely. And it you wasn't just these. these folk who become kind of, characters in your no, but those conversations those engagements yeah that daily or weekly or constant visits to the bath yeah put lime house, on your feet yeah had an effect on you right salt absolutely it changed my life yeah. it's brought in like a whole new world of breathing through things and acceptance acceptance and like sitting with discomfort and you know what's interesting? Uh, one of the projects um, that you've made, one of the people in the bathhouses uh, showed up. I don't know if you have images, have images. of that. Should the, we flip around? Of the, tripod, yeah. uh, the tripod sweep yes. work. And I don't, folk might recognize, I don't know if he appears in the video, does he? He does. So maybe you uh, could, okay. Okay. So, so This is a bathhouse person who bathhouse. then came into your art practice. That's right. So I love this idea of performance in an everyday space mm. that, um, uh, um, you know, um, finds its way into a kind of art space. Right. And, and so different terms. Yes. So this, I was there for this performance. It was quite intense. And I don't it think that hot. tripod sweep is, sweep is not just about this person on the screen, mm -mm. but talk about maybe tripod screen and this person who appears in, as a participant in this performance, but in fact, you first had encounters with that. 
So the this, bathhouse. Yeah, this person, this, his name is Yosef, and obviously he has a body practice. Yes, he has a very big body practice. Yes, and he came into Tripod Sweep, and I think Tripod Sweep is a game within certain terms. I just do the same move over and over. Um, you can you sign a little waiver at the beginning, and you enter in, and you're welcome to say no, and that's a big part of the performance. And if you say yes, then I'll engage with it. I'm not speaking, but. Um, That's the, this is the nonverbal. This is a nonverbal. I, I spoke about earlier, right? Right. One and nonverbal moments. Yes. Right in the bathhouse. Yeah. What is this? Well, I'm sorry to I, I digress here, but it's important. Right? Yeah, no. Um, so, so if you engage, if you say yes, then then it's on. I, I, I wanna it's sort of like my character in this performance is set on just merging with another human in this one move over and over and i the tripod sweep is a brazilian jiu-jitsu move that it's a push and pull and i sort of you'll see on the screen share that i'm uh you like i kind of i i glue myself to you yes and um, and so if people, they disengage, and it's also, this performance is so much about, we're all in the room together, so people, they, they, they unpack the move and they start to find ways to, to disassemble the move. They'll take my foot away, that's where the push-pull happens. They'll, um, they'll block the hip, they'll, and everyone's sort of doing it together, they learn we learn together like different strategies. People move themselves up against the architecture to make it so that, you know, people come up with all kinds of ways to engage with this move. And yes. so, so Yosef came and he was sort of, he didn't say no, but then he put up a real fight <laughs> about the move. And I think in this space, this was a space where like most of the audience were art goers, were engaging with the art contemporary art and we're like I know if I say yes I'm gonna I'm gonna do the thing and I'm gonna do a public moment with you and but I know that the terms are sort of within I don't know within art learning or yeah. art collectivity yeah. and with Yosef I feel like what happened was sort of like there were um, he it was like he was defending his it, he got really upset. You you saw, and he did. At one point, he did the thing where you put your foot up and you you block your hip, and then that's how usually that happens at some point or another. And I'll start to climb. It's like a boost. Mm -hmm. So I'll start to go over and around to get back down to do the tripod sweep. And but then he got into the rest corner, and then he. Took, he was the very balls on the fashion. floor signify the rest That's corner. That's the rest corner. That's so, and also I'm sort of like a ground dweller in this performance. I never leave the ground. This is where, and when I do the sweep, then we both end up on the ground. I pick you up, where, or like we, we, we're both on the ground, and yes. then I'll get up for a second. And then that's when the game resets, and I'll go back into the resting corner. Yes. But he would not accept that. And so he got into the resting corner, and then he... He's very into fashion, so he had these like beautiful Chanel, big beautiful Chanel sunglasses, and he took them and he cracked them. <laughs> I remember they were sort of rose tinted. Yeah, and then he stormed <clears throat> out, and yeah. we did actually process a lot. And he he said, "I didn't sign up for this mentally ill shit." <laughs> yeah, and and that's why we talked about. I think maybe shortly after this, and certainly. Uh, since we've been preparing for talking about your work today, yeah. a piece like this, and you know, um, those issues, those questions of consent. Right. And you know, my performance seminars, I always like graduate seminars. I like to give Kathy O'Dell, Contact with the Skin, right. Performance Art, Masochism, the 1970s, that contractual agreement that she writes about is so interesting fascinating we think about performance art mm. and these issues of consent right joseph did not go there to be humiliated that's right um and 
uh, other folk were there, not just Joseph. There were other people who kind of did the tripod sweep with you there and in other locations, right? Yeah, there was a so lot of So not just to talk ones. about that particular there, there I am, and you're taking down an old man, <laughs> but... <laughs> But I don't think people realize how incredibly your core strength is incredible. <laughs> you are incredibly strong. And I Joseph, train. <laughs> I, I train for these moments. But this is the thing, you know, when you do these performances with folk who are not trained. Yeah. And you engage with them. You ask them to participate, to engage with you in the tripod sweep, right. the takedown. You, have a, you certainly know that they don't have the same preparedness, right? Absolutely. And so what are you really asking them to do? A really serious question of, like, consent. Mm -hmm. And when people choose, as Joseph did, to participate in something without full understanding, right? do you have to tap them out? Do you just let them go through? I and then when he says, you fucked me up. You're right. <laughs> Are you responsible for fucking yes. him up emotionally? If so, how so? What did you do about it? If nothing, why not? So I, I think it is like, it's about responsibility. And I feel like it's like, um, we're not doing it with mats, which is a big deal. Yeah, that's, that's concrete that's floor. That's a floor yeah. that is hard. So I, I try to meet people where they're at, um, sort of like when I come in and I do a nonverbal, I go like, hmm? And here somebody's going, mm mm. But if they say, mm. -hmm, Freddie wasn't having it. So you really are, you're reading body language. Yeah, and I think so you have that, that to go back to what you'd said about sort of emotional sensitivity, it's almost like engaging with the tone that somebody decides to say yes in. And if people want to go hard, you saw, I think you weren't there for it, but when Levester and I went, I remember it was intense. Yep. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to engage with you. And then, and he, he does all kinds of, he has a really physical practice. I know. And so then it becomes, Levester I'll Williams. meet people there too. I mean, then it becomes more like a, I would compare it to like a jujitsu competition <laughs> almost, yeah. but I'm, but it's the, the terms are really different because I'm not using every move under the sun. I'm just trying to get one move. And look, I think in all of your work and in this piece, tripod sweep, you fuck gender. Maybe you absolutely do. And I think in a work like that with this clearly overworked um, male body, the presumption perhaps he comes to that performance with in terms of your representation or appearances rather is that he already had power over you and so i'm always interested in how in performances and work like yours how power is can it be ever shared i think that that's where responsibility comes in so it's like if we agree to engage in this together we both sort of have to understand to be on the same page about at least that, that the power is shifting back and forth between us. That, I mean, maybe part of it is the nonverbal part of it has something to do with that. Like in this, in the piece with Yosef, the moment with Yosef, he was being so verbal. I don't know if you remember, but he was talking all the way through it and he had all, <laughs> and, but also like sort of fighting about it and, and talking about winning and losing. And yeah. I think like with the art world audience, people are like, I win. It's always a win-win or like to engage is a win-win. The art world is no audience. It's like a kind of, well, yes. <laughs> it's no kind of audience. It's, they think they know everything. Right. This is why Joseph's uh, a Yosef participation was so fascinating because it didn't come with the pretense yeah. of knowing every fucking thing, right. which is what art world audiences come to performances with. That pretension, no. But he didn't, which is yeah. why I think the experience was that much richer. Yeah. And even to watch, I think with that piece, it is so much about um, maybe participating, but watching is also fascinating to see really the kind of physical... Uh, you know how power is being 
you know, how power is being uh, a kind of physical you know, mm. activity of the kind of power right. dynamics, right? Right. And so that guy is gigantic. Right. You would think he would take you down, but he did not. Yeah. And I feel like, but I think he, he did find really creative and exciting ways to upend. He totally disentangled the structure, which is sort of the most exciting part. When that can happen, that's, that's the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> or that I'm hoping to achieve. Yeah, yeah. And I think like with the tripod sweep, it sort of is about, it's like, I get very tired of myself after maybe an hour of doing this. I've done it for like ones where you go on and on and on for hours and hours at a time. And there's something about the exhaustion of like making, tangling people up or gluing yourself to people and being like, I'm just, you know, I've asked myself this question a lot of, do I want to make people's life hard? And I think that's not what I'm actually going for. But I chose the tripod sweep because I wanted to find a move that you couldn't ignore the interaction and the merging and the connection. And so it's sort of about, like, I think we live in this world, especially these days, where it's there's supposed to be a world where you can float through frictionless, especially with the internet. Yes. So oh, wonderful. that sort of yeah, yeah, frictionless yeah. state. And then this is, mm. I think, wrestling in general. But, you know, this is a moment where it's like, it's just not frictionless. And actually engaging with other people. In, and I find that, like, engaging with people through our bodies is a way that we can <coughs> get to a sort of honest or often right. enough of space where a lot of the, like, the veneer of yeah. social interactions and social codes gets broken down and it can just be actually what it is, whatever it is. That's right. That's right. And so the moments where people like shift it and, and problem solve it and, and upend it is that's the moment that you hope for yeah. because we're engaging yeah. in a, in an, in a really present way with yeah. one another. Well, I think uh, that's a really great way to kind of like shift into some conversations with the audience. And uh, my, my, my dear friend, Sean Leonardo, recently told me we had a talk and he talked about how performance art will perhaps be the most important thing to happen post pandemic mm. because I love this phrase about the friction. Yeah. And uh, sadly, we are bodies without organs That's to the right. people on the screen, but right. here I am, post-pandemic. <laughs> Rax, it is, it is, and relaxed. It is the, yeah, <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> what a marvelous phrase. I am vaxxed. It's really real. I'm not really relaxed. No, I'm vaxxed, it's... but not relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We're but, not quite there, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, in terms of this, the audience sensitivity, you know, the organic body, the virtual body critical art ensemble yeah. you know i'm teaching all the time i love that text text. Out. exactly my students are sarah lawrence too i so gave that to the teens <laughs> I, teach, I teach teenagers and i gave them the critical art ensemble I they were like everybody should read that it's really exciting everybody should read the critical art ensemble yeah um the performative matrix yeah here we are it's a wonderful there uh, it's all wonderful essay come into fruition. So let's shift out of this. I don't, Kate, by the way, the installation is really, Hi, really exceptional. So beautiful. And I, I'm thinking, I wanted to say early on when uh, Savannah was walking us through the exhibition that it requires a, an exceptional curator to organize a body of work like that and to install that work and have bodies move through it in a mm. way that matters. So I think you did a really exceptional way, uh, it's an exceptional uh, job from the installation that I can that I can see. So, just wanted to give you some props for that. I but so agree. Thank the you. flow. I've been, I've been joking for months that as I shifted out of a high school, college, didn't study for the exam nightmare. <laughs> repeat. I. I I'm at the point in my career where now I imagine a show needs to be installed and I have never seen the work before. And that is actually what happened this year for me and a lot of my colleagues across yeah. the world. Um, so it means a lot for you to say that. I really appreciate that. It was, it was very um, anxiety inducing to only see things in a 2D 
images and we were both very safe. We didn't do a single studio visit once. No, we did not. But I would send you a lot of late night, like I'm about to finish something. These are maybe the dimensions (laughs) and... Yeah, and we had a great crew at the Bell who was very patient with us as we said, we don't know what it's going to look like, but it will be something. Yes. <laughs> but I do want to, um, I'll, I'll continue chatting with you both, but I want to ask everyone who's in the webinar, you can ask questions in the chat and I'll pop on and share those with Savannah and Cliff whenever they come through. So we have our first question. Um, the question is, how do you feel your performances with tripod sweep or BJJ technique has deepened or not deepened your jiu-jitsu practice? And is that going to continue? Love and respect to you. Oh, that, thank you. Let's see. Um, of course it will because, because when you're obsessed with something, it doesn't go away. And um, yeah, we wanted to show our... We want to show our bodies. <laughs> and um, I feel like the oh, we're in an infinity room. There's no corners. It's all soft edges. <laughs> so um, BJJ, I feel like there might be something in the works around thinking more about the game and these ideas of like being in public, moving around together, and the idea of competition, which I find really, um, I think I've been too brainwashed by feminism to ever take it very seriously. So I'm always like, I'm going to compete. And then I'm like, "Uh, who cares? (laughs) But I, so I'd like to sort of get into that more and the dynamics of, I think what I'm really fascinated by in jujitsu is the way that people train and then put it into practice. And the idea that like, how how long does it take to absorb it's not osmosis it's through like it's like how many times does it take to to understand a move in real time as a raw unmediated event unfolding before you and like that it just happens with motor memory and um i'm not exactly sure how that's going to take place but i definitely think there's more to unpack in that world of competition and training your body towards competition but I would say, like, even rolling the news, it feels like such a jujitsu based practice, just in the way you're using pressure. It's like jujitsu of the fingers. Yeah. 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 It took a while, actually. It's a simple thing, but it take, everything takes time to learn. It's, there's a lot about learning, maybe. That's a ter- like a rich territory. There's another question that came through. Um, This is a very sweet one. This is for both of you. Yay. Person warns, this is extremely general, but when did you realize that you wanted to be an artist and could make a career out of your passion? And Cliff, I don't know you, but Savannah, your your story is very interesting. Circuitous. (laughs) Um, I'll, I'll launch off of that and say that it, I had a very circuitous route towards art. I had an early stage um, where I was sort of, I was working with my hands, making clothes, this and that, and then I met a writer. I've always, it's funny, when you're a kid, you make wishes about what you want to be when you grow up, yeah. and mine was a writer. <laughs> and <laughs> then it sort of like, I didn't the, know that. yeah, the genie gave me that, but in a way that I wouldn't have expected, which is like, I became... I embodied a writer and did not write the work, which actually, I think that brings up another uh, very like sort of in, intentional no. part of, it's like, are we who we are in, in the doing or in the saying who we are? Is what we do. Yeah. And so I became a writer or impersonated a writer for many years uh, for someone else who was a writer. And this person was writing off the page and they were an amazing performance artist, Laura Albert. And I sort of got entangled in someone else's terms of making art uh, for six years of my life. And in the meantime, I started, because I was sort of making things with my hands, I thought that, that it was about like making clothes in the context of fashion. 
Yeah. So I, I actually had a fashion, I don't know if you'd call it a career, but I had a small business and I would make clothes. I made clothes for eight years. Then I threw parties for another eight years, seems to be the roundabout year number mark, um, watermark. But um, that felt very much about installation, creating spaces for people, community. A lot of the yeah, things sure. I could sort of trace through all of these different activities and see the the line, oh, a the obsession, line. absolutely, and wrangling the body in different ways, and and so I came to art maybe in, I I would say it was like when I saw Robert Wilson's work, and I was so I just had never I was on the beach I saw I was on the beach and I was like what the fuck I didn't know you could do it this way, and 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 that sort of launched me into looking deeper into the context of making fine art and and yeah i mean here but do you think for you your life your creative artistic trajectory have you ever really had to name it maybe n not you know? except that the world the context names it for you yeah so there's certain boundaries within whatever your the context that you're working in names but like, I think that's for me what I find most fascinating about Savannah is the ability to like reinvent, you know, like a lot of artists just stay in the same fucking place. <laughs> and that's fear. Uh, and also you get acceptance if you do things people like. Whatever. You get cookies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say something when I will but yes, <laughs> that's true. But what what are the risk uh that you've sort of what are the risks in reinventing yourself in the way in the Ooh. ways that you have, right? Yeah. Um, those eight year shifts have certainly not been easy. No. Right? The transition from not frictionless. The stuff that you were doing. Exactly. <laughs> There's been a lot of friction. Yeah. So I mean, I guess when you read the biography, it seems seamless and it flows beautifully and how wonderful, but it must have been very difficult to make those changes, right? From a kind of yeah, you know, manipulative, mm. uh, crazy relationship with yeah. that person that you that creative work, bad work. dom. <laughs> when you then you shift to the uh, what is your own identity from that? Right, right. And I always say I hate talking about that JT stuff because I see you as an artist yeah. right now who has a show at fucking Brown University. Uh, that has nothing to do with that. That's to me, true. that's that's another time. I right? think that's really interesting. Like. Um, we, uh, well, I just read Operation Shylock, and there's a moment in it, I think I was talking to you about this, but there's a moment where he, the character, somebody's impersonating him and going out in public and using his persona to propel their own politics out into the world, and he says, I knew it was a bad idea, I should have just, like, called the cops on this person and called it a day, but instead he calls the person in a French accent, and just wants to engage she's just so curious and it's sort of about like a story opening in front of you and you can't deny it you can't say no so I think in a way i that thing about wanting to be a writer or having a sort of like a natural interest in language and storytelling which I think has always been there I was a ripe candidate to play this character because I it just I couldn't say no to it and it actually did follow with my interests my curiosities and I couldn't deny it in that yeah. way. Aren't you glad you didn't? I am. I'm really glad I didn't. Nothing is lost. No. Um, and, you know, you learn along the way what yeah. you, you just get more clear about what you want That's in right. the world. So what well, about you? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. Oh. I, I was going to ask. Uh, <laughs> I guess we, good boundaries. Yeah. Are there other questions or what do you all think? Can, there aren't any other questions i'll give people a couple more minutes and i actually want to jump in and say that it's something i've been very impressed by with savannah's work as well and i wonder if it was that early experience of having to completely shift your um you know uh, this persona that you'd adopted and performed and just leave that behind and actually go off in a totally different direction because when we first started talking i thought that we would be working with these massive wooden sculptures which I love so much and I'm still in love with and um, everyone walks into the gallery and says these are incredible but then 
they see the rest of the work and they get very excited about the new body of work made out of the newspapers. And it took, you know, it took me like a couple um, studio visits, both in person before the pandemic and after to really understand what you were doing with that new material. And I think that happens when an artist completely, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's an extension of your practice. So like, of yeah. course you can talk through that evolution, but to go into a totally different material. And then when we yeah. unpacked Curve, which is yeah. my favorite piece in the exhibition. I the mean, last I piece. Live with it. It's it's the last piece. And to me, and I've been explaining to people I've guided through and taken on tours that this is exactly what you want out of an incredible artist is someone who is willing to change directions materially and then do really good work, but then make like a phenomenal work like Curve as like, yes, I feel like that was the work where you truly understood how dye took to the material, mm -hmm. how the material, its weight existed when it was resin coated and hanging off the wall. And it just is such a stellar piece. All of the work is strong. That is my favorite. So I just want to add that, that, I love that it's so easy for artists to do the same thing for their entire career. And the fact that you've changed directions so many times in every way is a, is a strength speaks to, I'm excited to see what you do next. And um, well, Savannah, Savannah is markedly younger than myself. So, you know, I'm going to drop dead in about 25 Mark, years. Really? <laughs> <I mean. laughs> that is exciting, right? Yeah. You think about an artist's life or any human life is right. long. I probably won't live that long, but you will. <laughs> and like during that cor the course of that life, like the changes you make, like no one retires right. from being an artist. No, you just you do don't it retire. until you drop dead. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And your, your intention is like to keep shifting, yeah. keep changing. We had a conversation at your scrappy uh, uh, studio uh, in Brooklyn <laughs> for that thing I did for Bomb yes. magazine. And I said something or you responded about how one comes out many times. That's right. And I think as artists, we come out many times. We do. Right? Unless and it's we're vulnerable totally in the every closet time. And we just can't yeah. get out of that closet. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, good artists, you know, as Kate said, are always coming out. Yeah. They're I love always that. coming out again and again. Yeah. So, Sean, we are going for a drink somewhere in this neighborhood. <laughs> Where do you think? There's two we are, we, are, we are going to Easy Lover after we leave. Oh, I, have yeah. to, I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, but yeah. Easy Lover? Which, easy where lover. is that? <laughs> Graham and Bushwick Avenue, if you're in the area. Graham and Metropolitan. What is it called? I'll answer the two questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're all being invited to have drinks with Savannah yeah. and Cliff if you are in... New York. You can go. I'm in Providence. Oh, uh, me there. But uh, so the first question is, I miss this. Lisa says, I missed the first part. So forgive me if you already talked about it. But can you talk about the forms we are seeing on screen here? So maybe just a quick recap of the wave, as we nicknamed it. The wave. <laughs> so the wave is. Um, it's a sampling of all of the headline or the front pages of 2020. It's sort of like um, an oversized, I guess, silent film star gag where you, it's a vaudeville gag where you open the paper and you open the paper and then it swallows you whole, it becomes like Streganotis pasta and it takes over everything. Then there's these two tiles in the back. Those are stills that are printed on aluminum from the video about the baths. There's the corner news piece, this airy sort of anti-Cartesian thing, that blob in the back is a rolled news free weaving. There's the rocking tails, which are sort of, um, I guess like a poetic provocation. You sit on those tails and you feel, you feel the body that you once had you sit on your coccyx, your tailbone, and you rock back into the past, and then you rock forward and you hit, you engage with the body that you have now. There they are. There's the, the newest rocking tail, the long one in the center, which has wheels, so it can no longer rock, but it has an opposable tail. It's got a lot of new wingding cyborg effects. Next, I'm going to put like a suitcase handle on them, and then 
there is these free weavings. These are improvisational sort of blocks of the year past news. I started in November 2019 collecting the news, weaving it, and then stopped right before November 6th. <laughs> I mean, January 6th um, of 2021. And so these will go on. These are, you know, this is the first half of the year's news woven. This is Curve. That's the one Kate was talking about. The one on the left is the first free weaving. Um, these free weavings. There's a video behind the news of the bathhouse, East 10th Street Bath, which precipitated all of this new work. And there's some stills yeah, from it. Lisa says they are really compelling. Thank you for talking about them. Oh. Yeah. And then our last question, I think, uh, since Cliff is ready to, to go meet you all in person over a drink. Um, I love IRL. <laughs> Can you speak to the power dynamic exchange that you have with yourself, with your works, obviously in art making, but also in your life? I mean, I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> I, I do feel, um, I don't know if you feel this way, you're sort of like, why am I doing this to myself? You, I feel so anchored to making art. And sometimes I wonder why when I could just go and live a normal life, but obviously I can't. I would have done it by now. And so I guess that's, you know, the pull or the magnetism of making art is, I mean, it does feel like if you think about freedom is a definition of like filling your brain with your own thoughts, that this is like, we get to be free. We don't have a lot of, maybe we don't get to, some of us get a lot of money for it, but you kind of, at least you have, you get to do what you want and live in the world as you want and you don't have to sort of, sh you have choices around how you show up to your life and I find that ever, that's, it's so worth it. I, mean, I, I think I, the question though is um, about, well, it seems the question is about power dynamics in your work perhaps. The interest is in how you negotiate. Your work owns you. But I wonder, are they, I wonder if they're talking about yeah. the work itself, how power dynamics oh, function yeah. in the work itself, or if they mean about the art world. I think that it seems more about how it, how it functions in your work. The do work. you have an awareness of it, and how do you um, manage that, right? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I'm I mean, not I sure, actually. What, what, yeah. I don't know. And then the other part was about the, the personal yeah. um, power dynamics, and, which is a really interesting question. It is a really good ask. question. Do yeah. you feel that your personal life kind of, the dynamics of your personal life inform the decisions you make in your performances? I mean, they do. They absolutely do. But I think it, it's always the power is probably always ever fluctuating between, yeah. like, it's not like, I would say my work definitely owns me, yeah. but I feel like the way that I live my life is in constant dialogue yeah. with, you know. I mean, I wonder, terms. I like the conflation of power dynamics in one's practice and power dynamics in one's personal life, and perhaps a metaphor could be that in both we can be a top and a bottom. That's right, you can always <laughs> be switching. That's the important thing. I right? think so, yeah. I mean, again, I don't think it's stayed. I don't think it's to me, and also like happy accidents are very important in work. So, in the way that you sort of you fantasize about what a piece would be by the time you're actually making it, like, I don't even know if that's a power exchange. It's more just like, um, Improvisation steps yeah. in, and you 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 choose to engage with it. I mean, I think you choose to yeah, control it. Absolutely. I mean, I, for me, not to, not to talk about I want, me. Yeah, I want but, to hear. Yeah, maybe my work. It's um, you know, power is power is present in every aspect of our daily lives. It is just mm -hmm. fucking there. The moment you work up, power right. exists. However, sure. in the imaginative space, our lives. We think about performance art and power. For me, it's the audience, if they do not participate, as in tripod sweep, as in the the community pieces at the at the bathhouse, um, really seems to me that the audience has the ultimate 
power in any kind of mm. art exchange. I mean, um, if you go back to the idea that the work, once the work is out there, it's not yours. It's theirs to do what they want with it. Yeah. This old-fashioned shit, right? Yeah. John Dewey, art yeah. is experience. Right. Right? The experience of art is undergoing for the viewer. They're undergoing the experience in a similar way that the artist is undergoing it. Yeah. Is, I always think that that text is so important to performance art, to art in general, is thinking about the audience, because people don't often talk about it explicitly, and it should be stated explicitly, certainly in performance art about those power dynamics. The audience is always in charge because yeah. those motherfuckers can turn their backs and walk out. Right. And if Bor what is the guy, the big dude? What is his name? Yosef. Yosef, if he had refused, if he had walked out, there would not have been these That's marvelous right. photographs, that incredible experience, right? Yeah. So, I mean, talk, I mean, I think that to me is a more interesting question yeah. to ask about your sensitivity to audience mm. more than your interest in power yeah. dynamics with the audience. Yeah. I, it's sort of like I have to sit with that one longer. I don't have a kind of clear cut answer with it. I'm sorry. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have actually another one that came through. Um, through the practice of working with newspapers, did you become intrigued or fixated on any particular words or phrases, especially with an emphasis of the materiality, musicality, and poetry of the words rather than the news story? And I have to add that that's where the title came from, is that Savannah came up with the phrase soothing the seams in just passing, telling me how they were literally soothing the seams of the, the newspaper curve, the wave. And I Extremely wrote it down it. knowing that that was gonna be the title because as a curator, you listen to the artists and you wait for these moments where you can like pull the essence of the work out and use it for to your purposes to come up with a title or for an essay. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, part of rolling the news is constantly being sort of distracted by stories. And at, at, at a certain point, I used to sort of, I would write down, I'm like, I want to read that later. <laughs> After I'd slashed it, I couldn't read it anymore. But I think that's where, like, sort of taking notes on things that come through these images, these stills, like, I don't know what I'm going to do with these, but I'm definitely collecting them because because the tone of the day is moving through you and you do wonder about that moment and you're thinking about it retrospectively. And so words pop out, stories pop out. You're always thinking about it as you're doing it. The data is like moving through you. So that is our last question. It might be a cocktail time for you both. <laughs> hour and 20 minutes that's, that's, that's significant. yeah i mean it flew by well thank you everyone for joining us we're going to um end the webinar i still feel strange saying those phrases uh, oh yeah even this far in call it. but it, this will be recorded and shared um on our website so if you signed up through eventbrite which you had to have to participate tonight you'll be getting an email with the link once it's available on the Brown Arts Institute's website. So That's thank you excellent. everyone. And thank you to I, Savannah and, and Cliff. Thank, thank you, you Kate. Kate. Thank you, Cliff. And also thanks to Exponential Growth, which is where we're having this amazing <laughs> webinar. And thanks, Kate. Thanks, Brown. Thanks to the audience for coming. Yes, audience yes. sensitive. Yes. Be audience sensitive. You have to be. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye.